Remember that we have two big goals in this series of videos. Uh, one of the goals is that we want to learn how to take an overall vector and break it down into its components. And the other goal is that we want to learn how to take the components of a vector and build them up into the overall vector. Uh, well, uh, congratulations, we've accomplished the first half of that goal. We have learned how to take an overall vector and break it down into components. Uh, so I hope that you feel comfortable that you really have mastered that skill. That's what all of the, uh, the, most, the latest uh, round of problems has been about. Taking an overall vector and breaking into components. I hope that you feel you've made some good progress on that skill. Uh, you might have noticed that we've done a lot of examples of that because I think it's a very important skill for a student to completely master before they go on in physics. Uh, but you know, we might still not have done enough examples. Uh, maybe you need more examples. I got a little bored with those examples, so I don't want to put any more uh, in the videos. Um, but you might need to do more work uh, before you really feel that you totally mastered breaking an overall vector into its components. Well, I'm sure you can find plenty of practice in your textbook, so make sure that you've really mastered that skill um, before you move on to the further topics in physics. Uh, so in general, before you move on, now would be a good time to go back and redo the questions in the previous portion of the videos. Um, don't move on to our next topic unless you really feel you've mastered the previous questions that we've gone through al already in the videos. And if necessary, go to your textbook and find more problems to help you master that material. Uh, only practice can give you the skill level that's necessary to succeed as the physics course proceeds. However, uh, now we're going to go on and take a look at our second question. Our second question was how to take the components of a vector and build up the overall vector. If you're given the components, you should be able to figure out the overall vector. So that's what we're going to do now. We finished this first transition, and now we're going to figure out how to go from the components to the overall vector. In these videos, we have been discussing vectors. Now, a vector is something that has both a magnitude and a direction. A, a vector has both a magnitude and a direction. Now, I think the simple concept there is magnitude. The magnitude is, rep is represented by the length of the arrow. I think most students don't have too much trouble uh, understanding how to represent the magnitude of a vector. You might say the magnitude is 7 or 8 or 3.4. Uh, it's pretty easy to represent magnitudes. Now, of course, magnitudes are represented by lengths, so they're always positive. And because they're always positive, uh, we don't indicate their sign. When something's always positive, we don't need to always plus, put a plus sign in front of it. We only indicate signs for things that theoretically could be positive or negative. So since a, mag a magnitude is always positive, uh, we don't ha actually have to indicate that with a sign. In fact, it's better not to indicate that with a sign. Maybe the, the trickier concept is direction. I think students often are a little confused about how to represent the direction of a vector. That's a little bit understandable because we actually have two different ways of representing directions. Uh, there's one way to represent the direction of a vector component, and there's a different way to represent the direction of the overall vector. So again, the direction of the overall vector is represented using one method, but the direction of the component is represented using a different method. Uh, how do we represent the direction of a component? Well, we're already quite familiar with that. We represent the direction of a component using a sign. The direction of a vector component is represented using a sign. For example, here we have an overall vector called v that has a magnitude of 5, and you can see that v is pointing up and to the left. The overall vector v is pointing up and to the left. I've already broken this vector into its components. Since it's pointing up and to the left, it has a left component and an up vertical component. And I've already worked out for you what uh, the lengths of the components are. So the job here is not to figure out the components, we just want to talk a little bit about how they're represented. So we know that the magnitude of the horizontal component is 3. And you can already see how we're representing the direction of the horizontal component. We're representing that direction with the sign. You can see that I've chosen to the right to be positive. And since this component is to the left, its direction is indicated by a negative sign. So clearly we can indicate the direction of a component, a vector component, just by using a plus or a minus sign. We did the same thing over here for v sub y. The magnitude of v sub y is 4. And what's the direction of v sub y? Well, v sub y is pointing up. And we've chosen up as our positive direction, so we represented that direction as a positive, positive 4. Again, we see that you can represent the direction of a vector component using a sign, plus or minus. 
So since vector components can be either positive or negative, it's important to always include the sign, not just in front of negative components, but also in front of positive components. One of the habits we've been trying to build in these videos is getting in the habit of always indicating the sign for a vector component, not just in front of negative components, but also in front of positive components. So we can say that the magnitude of the x component is 3. And then if we want to represent um, the vector component as a whole, we can say that the sine component is negative 3, which includes both the magnitude and the direction. Well, you can see then why we need a special dot symbol. We need a dot symbol to distinguish between the magnitude of a vector component and the signed component. Uh, remember that um, this is not an official symbol, but I think that it's useful for students to have a separate symbol for magnitudes of components to distinguish them from the signed components. And we can say the same thing for v sub y. The magnitude of v sub y is 4. Since this is a magnitude, we don't indicate a sign, because magnitudes are always positive. But then, if we want to indicate the signed component, we would say the signed component is positive 4. That would be the sign component indicated without the dot. Again, we see that it's quite useful to have a different symbol for the magnitude than for the signed component. But what about for the overall vector? What about for the overall vector? Clearly, the magnitude of this overall vector is 5. But how can we represent the direction of the overall vector? Uh, I've already mentioned on a number of occasions that you can't represent the direction of an overall vector using a sign. You can't represent the direction of an overall vector using a sign. Uh, and uh, hopefully it's clear why that is. How did we know that the sign on the x component was negative? How did we know that the sign on the x component was negative? Well, we knew that because the x component was anti-parallel anti to the x-axis. Since this x component was pointing left and the x-axis is pointing right, the x component was anti-parallel to the x-axis, which we could interpret as a negative sign. And similarly, the y component here was parallel to the y axis, pointing in the same direction. So we interpreted that as a positive sign. But generally speaking, the overall vector isn't going to be parallel or anti-parallel to either axis. The overall vector isn't going to be parallel or anti-parallel to either axis. Clearly, this overall vector here is not parallel to either the x or the y axis or anti-parallel to the x or the y axis. So there's no way that we can apply that previous method to figure out the sign of the overall vector. Um, and you can see, the, um, if you, you might say to yourself, well, this is kind of pointing to the left. So you might think the overall vector should be negative, but it's also kind of pointing up. So you might think the overall vector should be positive. There really is no good answer to that. There is no good way to determine what the sign should be for the overall vector. Uh, we can determine signs for the components because remember the components are parallel to the axes. Something I've mentioned on a number of occasions is that we draw the components parallel to the axes. Well, that allows us to um, determine the sign for the components, because if you're parallel um, uh, uh, to the axes, you're going to be, strictly speaking, either parallel or anti-parallel, and that will let us determine your sign. But the overall vector would generally not be parallel or anti-parallel to either axis, and so it's not, there's no clear way to determine the sign for that. So we need to have a totally different way of determining the direction for the overall vector. There must be some other way to determine the direction of the overall vector, and we've already discussed what that is. The other way is simply, to, um, is simply to specify an angle that is being formed by the overall vector. The way to determine the direction of the overall vector is to specify an angle that is forming. Here, for example, we've specified this angle of 53 degrees. Now we're trying to describe the direction of the overall vector. Well, we could say that it's making an angle of 53 degrees. And then if you draw the vector, you can actually draw it in the angle. And people can see what the direction is. Or um, if you're not going to actually draw a picture, then you have to describe it in words. I hope you can see why I would describe this as above the negative x-axis. Um, this angle is clearly not being bounded by the y-axis. This angle is being bounded by the x-axis. 
But notice that this boundary over here is actually pointing in the negative x direction. So I hope you can see why I would call that the negative x axis. And we're clearly not below the x axis. Um, this angle is above the axis. So this is 53 degrees above the negative x axis. The key thing, though, is to recognize that the way to specify the direction of the overall vector is with an angle. 